Steve. How's it going? Oh, it's great. It's great. I, uh, I tapped some sugar maples. Nice. Are they running? Slowly. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, <laughs> two days ago and today a little bit. Yeah, it's the most normal year we've had in a while in terms of February. So just waiting patiently. You, you got any plans this week? Uh, we'll see. Hopefully it'll, it'll break this weekend and we'll get some sap and be on our way, but yeah, we'll see. We don't have any control over that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have lines? Yes, we do. Oh, cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we'll get started here. We're going to, um, wrap up this webinar series with our third webinar here tonight. And uh, I'm going to start off the evening here talking about some of the farm business, uh, some of the pieces to become a farm, um, and then some of the ways the fresh mushrooms are handled and, and sold, and talk about some of the logistics of that. And then I'll toss it over to Willie for the, the end of the webinar. We'll get into a little detail about um, fruiting and, and some big picture ways that fungi are going to continue to, to grow and expand and, and flood the world, hopefully. Uh, happy to have you all here. Just to, as a reminder, uh, I put a link in the chat for the Fungi Alley website, which is our home base for this project. And uh, there you can find all the links to the assignments <coughs> and tools that we have offered through this. We're going to be posting uh, a link for the application to be joining us for the next step in this adventure. Uh, we'll post that probably by noon tomorrow is our goal. Um, and you'll get an email with the link to that, but it will be posted to that um, Fungi LA page. So you can check there as well. And uh, yeah, we're hoping to get some folks who are already growing or are ready to jump in to participate in our project, which is to collect data about um, different methods and as we've talked about in the last webinar and and collect some data about labor and material costs associated with those so that we can hopefully um, coalesce that data along with the work we're doing here at Cornell and um, and provide some in in-depth in data back to the community about um, different methods and their cost benefits. Um, so I'm really excited for that, um, getting the research underway here on campus and um, comparing uh, straw production and block production systems um, in, a, in a controlled environment. So um, let's jump right in and um, get into this question of when am I a farm and talk about that a little bit. So uh, I, this is the checklist I would suggest. Um, considering working with when you're uh, becoming a farm uh, in the US. Um, you can uh, start really considering yourself a farm when you uh, accomplish or start working on all these kind of pieces. So there's six main things. One is to uh, really declare that you're intending to sell or you're actually selling uh, some kind of farm product. Um, the, the ag census often says $1,000 minimum is when you start reporting uh, to that uh, agency, but technically whenever you're uh, intending, even if you're not selling products, you can start um, filing and, and claiming some of the benefits of being a farm. Really recommended that you uh, register a name, a farm name. So a DBA is doing business as, an LLC is a limited liability corporation. DBAs are nice because you can um, work with a county, usually is about $25, something like that, in that range, and it takes about 20 minutes to fill out the paperwork, and you have a name now associated with your business. LSC is a little more details. Uh, there's a few more details in there. You, you need to file with the state that you're in, uh, generally, and, and have some kind of public notice in newspapers, which are well set up to handle that. Um, and file some articles of organization, things like that. A couple more steps, a little more expensive, usually more in the $250 uh, avenue. 
but um, either of these is going to give you the opportunity to start um, opening a bank account in the name of that entity. And DBAs are nice when you're not maybe sure of the name you're going to use because you can always accumulate those and um, and then change them over time. And LLC is a little more of a commitment. Um, third thing would be to, to open a bank account and really start to track your um, expenses and income separately from any kind of personal um, accounting. And the reason we want to do that is to really get a sense of how the business is going. Uh, and it's fine if you give yourself a loan, you give the business a loan from your own personal finances if you're getting something started, but um, it's really important to start separating those. I've worked with farms that sometimes have been going for decades or more, uh, mixing their business expenses with their uh, individual uh, income and expenses, and that can be really hard to track and report at the end of the year. Um, and uh, oh, Willie's saying we're stuck on the first slide. Sorry, folks. Let's see. Should look at a checklist here. Of, oh, let me share something differently and see if that works. Are we seeing something different now? Yep, that looks good. Cool, thanks. Uh, so fourth thing would be finally Schedule F, that is profit and loss from farming. That's a federal form with the IRS. Really important to look at that form. We'll check it out in a minute. Um, and start to categorize your expenses um, in correlation with that form so that it's really easy at the end of the year to uh, pull everything together and submit that. Um, fifth thing would be to register with your local farm service agency. This is a, a USDA, a federal agency that um, keeps track of farms and links different farm businesses to land bases and gives you a farm number. And this starts to then give you eligibility for uh, insurance, crop insurance for cost share uh, programs that are offered through USDA and NRCS, which is Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, <clears throat> and, and also to, to uh, facilitate disaster payments if you have a off year, you can sometimes get benefits from that. And the sixth thing would be to get product liability. If you're gonna sell a food product to customers, you wanna cover yourself. And so we'll talk a little bit about how to go about that but that's a, it's a piece of the puzzle as well. So the benefits before you even start to really see income and profit show up on your, um, on your radar, you can usually uh, start to see the benefits from writing off your farm expenses. Now, often folks are holding other jobs or the family has wage income that um, taxes are taken out of. And by claiming your farm expenses and, and in many cases claiming a loss, as you're getting your farm going, you can write off and include those and that really helps your, your personal financial picture. Many states, if there's a sales tax associated with products that you might be buying for your farm, um, you don't have to pay sales tax for those. Speaking a little specifically to New York on that, but there's a specific process which I'll share, but um, you should check with your, your state um, agencies to understand the process in order to um, remove those from your plate. So in New York State, that saves us 8% off of all of our purchases, which can be significant. As I mentioned, we can, as we uh, check, off, check off those boxes, become eligible for farm uh, programs through USDA. And often then as we're a farm, we can also benefit from some kind of ag assessment. In New York State, that's when you gross 10,000 in income or more, you can start to claim the land base that you're using for farming and you'll get a lower tax rate. In many other states, um, there's some kind of classification for agriculture, for farming, for forestry. These are all things that can benefit you um, in terms of your property taxes. So before you even start to uh, gain the income from the business, these are benefits that are really available. And again, we've worked with farmers over the years that sometimes haven't uh, made uh, maximum use of these um, opportunities from the get-go. Um, critical to <clears throat> any farm enterprise is to track your uh, transactions and um, a lot of farms start off with the shoebox me method which is really just to keep track of your receipts and then um, deal with the, the headache at the end of the year of trying to sort everything out categorize things of course we can take a, a step further beyond that but um, at least you know keeping a paper record of transactions and you're supposed to keep that um, record for at least five years um, as you as you claim them on your taxes 
most farmers um, <clears throat> get to a point where they realize that a, a more sophisticated method of tracking expenses is, is valuable. And so uh, some kind of software is really nice. Uh, QuickBooks is really uh, excellent one in terms of being able to pull from data that shows up in your bank account feed uh, and match that up with invoices and other things that you're doing on the farm. So um, there's no uh, perfect software out there. There's a lot of different options. But certainly tracking your transactions is going to be part of maintaining a really good farm um, business. Here's your Schedule F. <clears throat> um, if we look at the part two, the farm expenses, it's really important to match your transactions and categorize them based on these expenses. That doesn't necessarily uh, equate to um, you having the type of um, categories that you may want. So for example, for our farm, 80% of our expenses usually fall under line 30, which is the supply line. And um, um, but I, I personally and, and my wife want to know, you know, what are the expenses associated with mushrooms versus our maple syrup production versus our lambs and our sheep? And so we have subcategorized those further, but on this tax form, all of those get lumped into one um, item that goes on that line. So it's really recommended that you work um, and build a relationship with a local uh, accountant who's familiar with farm tax policy. They're going to help you benefit um, to the max in terms of um, filling out this form and depreciating the assets related to the business and getting you the best value um, as you file each year. Ag assessment, <clears throat> this, is, this is specific to New York, so if you're in a different state, you need to kind of dig deeper, but this is all based on property taxes and land. Um, in New York, if you have at least seven acres in production and 10,000 in gross sales, you can apply for ag exemption. There's a process that our small farm program outlines. Um, in our guide to farming in New York. In New York, you can count uh, 2,000 of that 10,000 can be wood products. And you can actually use mushrooms if they're grown outdoors in a forest environment as um, the entirety of that 10,000 if you get to that scale. Um, maple syrup also counts in New York State. So what happens in New York State is they look at the soil value and they basically, um, um, if my land was taxed at 2,000 an acre, Based on the, the, the land values you can see in the chart here, those uh, taxable um, amounts would be reduced based on being an ag exemption. Key thing to keep in mind with all ag exemption uh, processes, land and property tax exemptions or reductions is that this is usually, a, these are usually programs in states that require you to maintain that level of production, whatever the requirements are. So if you start to change your land use, you start to change your practices, you may be liable for past taxes or, or those changes. So do your homework, um, but it can be a significant way to uh, support your farm venture moving forward. Again, in New York State, really simple method for um, eliminating sales tax from uh, your cost ledger is to uh, use this form ST125. Basically, you fill out your contact information, you sign at the bottom, and you give this to anyone who is um, who you're buying those those materials from? Uh, most of the you know local feed stores and the the hardware stores and things like that are used to this, and so they'll put it on file. They'll attach it to your phone number, and then they'll usually work from there to um, to make sure that you know when you make a purchase, you just give them your phone number, and then they can automatically deduct that sales tax from from your receipt. And then finally, um, small farm product liability. This article is a couple years old, but it's a really good summary. What's really key with product liability is to find an insurance carrier that um, is able to create a custom package for you based on your sales, based on your plans. So you wanna sit down with someone who understands where your farm is at in year one, where it may be at in year 10, in year 20, and can adjust the uh, product liability package to meet those needs. So a lot of agencies might offer you a blanket policy or something that's you know a fixed price. So whether you're selling 100 pounds of mushrooms or 10,000 pounds of mushrooms, you might be paying a similar rate. And that can really hinder young and beginning operations. And so, um, and so yeah, what's really important is to uh, do your homework, find someone you want to work with, and find someone who can customize those options. And then, of course, you can add on to product liability things like you know ensuring your equipment or your buildings or things like that. And so 
took us a while personally to find. Um, we worked through our local, uh, our Farm Bureau uh, agency. Farm Bureau is a nationwide organization that has an affiliation with Nationwide Insurance. So often those companies are used to working with farmers and farm operations and those agents can help customize a, a policy to your needs. But that's certainly not the only one. Um, farm Family is a common one that's used in the Northeast um, and there's some others out there. And if you have a good experience with um, an insurance provider, feel free to share that in the chat box so folks can get some ideas. Um, what's most important is you actually talk to a human <laughs> and that human hopefully visits your farm and builds a relationship with you and uh, works a policy that's customized to your situation. So with fresh mushrooms, we're gonna talk a bit about um, the process of taking them from harvests and safely and in a sanitary fashion, bringing them into market. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about kind of the, the nuances and the particulars with that at this point. I wanna mention that we have a resource, the Cornell Small Farm Program, that's called From Harvest to Market. And so this is an outline of all the post-harvest things you need to consider. Right now, um, this PDF uh, of this document is being, we're working on publishing it online as individual fact sheets. And we hope to have that up in just a couple weeks. But I do have the PDF available um, and I can make that available. <clears throat> we could post it right to the uh, website that Fungi Ally is, um, is hosting this project on if you want to dig into it. But a lot of the things we're talking about here are reiterated in the guide and, 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 and many more um, items as we go. So things like <clears throat> regulations around medicinal products, value added products, those sort of things are covered in this guidebook. And that before we kind of dig into the, the nuance, what I want to encourage folks to think about is that often um, new farm enterprises and even some established ones are on this teeter-totter and they overemphasize the technical aspects of farming. In this case, they learn how to grow really nice, high quality mushrooms, whether that's indoor mushrooms, outdoor mushrooms, or some combination. And they focus on that and they focus on that and they start producing uh, pounds and pounds of mushrooms, but they haven't done the business and the marketing side of developing um, their enterprise. And I'd encourage um, folks to try to balance this and start asking around, start bringing samples to markets start exploring what those things look like before you start really ramping up production because we have too many stories of farms that produce really beautiful products but can't get them to market because they haven't established those, those pathways and those relationships and that's a really important thing um, in order to do that. Oop, sorry. <clears throat> um, with markets, uh, a really basic way to think about where we're gonna sell our mushrooms. Uh, we have on the left side here, direct markets. So these are markets where we're interacting in some way with a end consumer that's gonna eat the mushrooms, enjoy the mushrooms and come back. Generally speaking, we see a higher price per pound for those direct markets, but also a higher cost of labor um, and sometimes material inputs in order to um, provide those products to, to the market. Um, so this is a chart from a, a cooperative extension guide here in New York that um, you know, gets into the, the nuances of what we call market channels, these different options for how you could get your product. And depending on the scale of your business, your goals and how you wanna spend your time, some markets are gonna be more appealing and some are gonna be less appealing. And that's really an individual decision. So we look on the right side and we see wholesale markets. These are markets that are um, generally purchasing your product and then relaying them on to that end consumer. Um, so indirect markets is sometimes the way they're framed. Grocery stores, restaurants, these are common ways that mushrooms are sold um, on a small local scale and can be great ways to move volume uh, at a reasonable price. Usually the price per pound is, is going to be lower, but you're going to do a lot less to get those products to market um, as we go. So there's no perfect channel here. They all have their pros and their cons. And we have to develop these uh, slowly and over time in order to have a successful mushroom enterprise. So generally speaking, um, in New York State, I know this is true, and I don't, I haven't found a state yet, this is not true, where um, to sell um, fresh, uncut, uh, <laughs> this says shiitake, but really any mushrooms, this is an old slide from a shiitake presentation, but um, it's, it holds true for all mushrooms. They're lumped together with all vegetables and produce. And so if they're um, clean and they're in uh, clean containers, then they generally don't require any licenses in order to sell. The exception to that is when you get to a certain threshold where 
you're selling more than $25,000 in sales. And those sales are outside of a 275 mile range. In essence, they are not local anymore. If you fall into those categories, what you get into is what is known as the Food Safety Modernization Act or FSMA, F-S-M-A. And um, this is, these are rules that are now in place, uh, produce handling rules and essentially gap certification, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and so you need to pay attention to those things if you're getting to that type of scale. Um, <clears throat> generally speaking, what, whatever scale we're at, whatever, however we're working with mushrooms, there's some general good guidelines for sanitation as we harvest these mushrooms and bring them to market. The major difference with mushrooms as uh, compared to other uh, forms of produce is we're not going to wash these mushrooms. Mushrooms are 90% um, plus water, depending on the species, and um, washing them generally degrades their quality quite significantly. So it's important to think about that as we handle them and move them from the production area to our markets. So things like really basic ideas like, you know, washing our hands or using gloves as we're harvesting, harvesting into clean uh, food grade containers. We like to use um, these stainless steel bowls, which we can uh, sanitize very easily. Um, as we're holding mushrooms in the fridge, we'll use a food safe container to do that. Um, harvesting with scissors um, instead of a knife is something we often recommend because you're able to uh, reduce the potential of you nicking yourself and, and you know, bringing, bringing that into the, the, the product um, and just keeping everything kind of clean and in a clean condition. Now, if you, again, if you're under those, um, those thresholds I mentioned before, generally speaking, good uh, common sense practices are enough. If you get into those higher echelons, then you have to start to pay attention to produce safety rules and have a little more of a, of a specific setup in terms of being able to process and clean your product. Certification uh, for all farm products, but specifically for mushrooms, is something that um, is really, uh, uh, really a marketing question in many cases. Um, many states, like New York State, have a grown certified program. Um, in New York, that's a combination of an environmental plan for your land, as well as a GAP certification. GAP is, stands for Good Agricultural Practices. There are good agricultural practice standards specific to mushroom production. And most uh, producers are gonna wanna think about um, moving towards GAP certification over time as they develop their enterprise. Most of the, um, <clears throat> most of the sort of standards for GAPs in mushroom production are, are things that make sense. You know, providing employees with a uh, place to wash their hands in a, in a sanitary bathroom, uh, cleaning your, uh, your product in a clean space, uh, and, and generally keeping track of all these things, having a food safety plan for the farm, um, having traceability measures so that every lot of mushrooms you're selling has a number associated with it. So if there's any issue, it can be traced back. These are basic things that um, make sense and are good ideas, and um, often markets will require these. Some farmers markets require gap certification. Many um, wholesale markets do, and so it's a good thing to check out and get involved with. As far as organic or certified naturally grown, these are two programs that offer um, a sort of certification process where there's standards developed and those standards are then um, assessed on your farm every year. And then you can use the logo <clears throat> as a way to market your product. Um, a lot of farmers choose not to do this, especially if their um, markets are, are local and their customers are people they interact with. But as your products get further and further from the farm, your customers get further and further from you. These can really be beneficial ways to market your product. And you can often get a premium in terms of the price if you have these certifications. So organic certification would be a third party certification where um, a representative from <clears throat> your state agency would uh, come to the farm, complete the certification on an annual basis. You'd pay a fee and then you'd get that certification. Sort of a naturally grown or CNG is what's called a peer to peer certification where another farmer will actually come to your farm and help complete the paperwork. It's a nice way to <clears throat> um, have some interaction as well with other folks in the industry. Uh, if you're interested, you can dig deeper into the CNG mushroom standards. I was part of a group um, from multiple states that developed these standards for water quality, uh, for substrate use, uh, for processing and packaging and things like that. 
and so even if you don't enroll in the program, it provides a nice template to look at in terms of um, how to adhere to the standards and, and keep things in, uh, in the right way. So harvesting our mushrooms and storing them is a really critical part of this. We talked in the past webinars about proper harvesting techniques. So I often get pictures from new growers with these kind of pancake shiitakes or pancake mushrooms where the caps are flat or unfurled. Perfectly edible, perfectly delicious, but not really gonna hold up in terms of quality standards in the long term through the transport and storage process with your, your customers. So uh, really thinking about harvesting our mushrooms a little bit <clears throat> earlier in the process where those caps are still have a bit of a curled edge and a bit of rigidity is gonna maintain their quality. So the difference between these two pictures might be several days in terms of how they hold up in the fridge. If I were to deliver five pounds of the shiitakes there on the bottom <clears throat> to a restaurant um, after two or three days, they might open the bag and find them to be kind of yellow or brown and the quality to be degraded and they're, they're kind of dried out. Versus if I deliver mushrooms in the state of the top photo, uh, those often last a week or more in a refrigerated setting and are gonna maintain their quality as they go into the production chain. Thorn mushrooms, we don't <laughs> seal them up in plastic we use paper or breathable bins, so bins that don't seal. I'll show you an example in a minute. We focus on quantity. We don't wanna to put too many um, mushrooms in one bin or bag because we can, that weight can actually um, degrade their quality over time. And generally we store them in a, a, a kind of fridge temperature environment is perfectly fine. Um, or even a bit cooler. So we kind of keep our fridge around 36, 35 degrees. Um, as a way to maintain quality on the mushrooms. And like I said, if you uh, harvest them when they're um, a little underripe, um, arguably, uh, you're gonna have a longer shelf life and they're gonna hold up better in transportation and storage. So here's some breathable bins, basic uh, food grade quality bin. We just get them from a local restaurant supply and you can also order these online. So the, the lid just kind of nestles on top and we usually cover our mushrooms with either a paper bag or a towel in order to keep the moisture from condensing on them and integrating them as they're waiting to go out into the world. Here's some nice uh, golden oysters harvested at a pretty good time, maybe a little past what I'd like. You know, you learn with the different mushroom species what they can tolerate um, in terms of when you harvest them and how you store them. So golden oysters in particular, are a bit more brittle than uh, for instance, the blue oysters. And so we have to be more considerate in the ways that we handle and, and and take care of them. And as we get ready for markets, a lot of our restaurants that we personally supply to, will just double bag them in. Um, they're recycled paper, but they're not recycled as in, I just put my groceries in them. They're, we buy them in reams, we double bag them. And then these are a good way uh, for about, you know, uh, five pounds, six pounds of mushrooms to be, to be packaged and sold to these markets. As far as cleaning and grading goes, there are actually like, official mushroom brushes out there. We're gonna not wash our mushrooms again, we're gonna brush them, we're gonna clean the debris off them. Um, so we like to just use a simple array of, uh, you know, paint brushes from the hardware store. Obviously not paint brushes that we're using to paint things, but <clears throat> solely do dedicated to cleaning our mushrooms. So a couple of those, we're dusting off the dirt, <clears throat> we're getting any insects or bugs that might be showing up, especially in our outdoor systems, and then they're ready to go. Um, with some of the shiitakes, particularly I work with shiitake growers who do outdoor production. In the heat of the summer, we can see these thrips show up and it's important to get them out of there. They don't actually do a lot of damage to the mushrooms, but they do need to be cleaned out. And the worst way to do that is to blow on them, which is one of the old timer ways of doing it. Better ways to do it are to tap the cap of the mushroom to get these bugs out, um, or even use something like toothpicks or a toothbrush or a small brush in order to brush them out. Um, we try to minimize in our, in our um, uh, different production system management, the presence of these, but again, especially with outdoor production, they're gonna show up and, and they're an important thing, obviously, to clean out. Grading mushrooms, <clears throat> this is not, uh, there's not a standard grading system like with some other products, but it is important to grade your mushrooms and consider what channels are gonna accept different qualities. Um, so um, depending on your customers, depending on what they're paying at, at a premium price, it's really important to maintain quality. That's what we hear time and time and time again from growers who are successful mushroom producers is they only are successful as they maintain a high quality product. So here's some A-grade shiitakes with nice round caps, 
clean um, gills, no deformities or damage. So we might call these grade A. Grade B might have a little bit of damage, but mostly are intact and look pretty high quality, but a couple of deformities in there, here and there scattered about. And then grade C, which could be um, product for uh, what we call the farmer grade. So sometimes these are the ones we're, we're eating, or we might be trimming these off or turning these into value added products um, as, as, as a future for them. So we grade these out as we're harvesting them. We have different grades and then we match those to different uh, clients that we're serving through our sales. As far as weighing uh, products, generally speaking across the board, um, <clears throat> if they're, uh, if items are going to be packaged in something where there's going to be a label and they're going to be put in a retail location, they generally need to be weighed on a certified scale. And that's a scale that's actually um, checked off by your local Bureau of Weights and Measures every year. If you're selling uh, mushrooms in a package to a grocery store, that would be required. If you're selling them in bulk, like you drop off 20 pounds to a grocery store and they display them in a bulk way, customers take what they want and weigh them out, then that's the uh, grocery store's uh, responsibility to have that certified scale. If I'm selling to a CSA or I'm selling to a restaurant, uh, it's essentially an agreement. So I don't have to have the certified scale. Uh, we're assuming that we're, we're uh, under the understanding that we're you know, selling them around five pounds of mushrooms or something like that. But anytime you put a package and a label on it, you're gonna have to have that kind of requirement met in order to sell them legally in um, all states. As far as packing and labeling mushrooms, the packaging you require is really in relationship to the markets that you choose. So for us, for our CSA customers, for our restaurants, these are folks who are already committed and bought in. They know what they're getting. So paper bags work great. Um, and again, not paper bags that I just used for some other thing, but we buy recycled paper bags from our local supplier and <clears throat> package our mushrooms up in that. If I was selling at a farmer's market, I would want to display the mushrooms so that consumers can see them. I like those cardboard clamshells because you can display the mushrooms open and then fold them up and close them up and send them on their way when they're purchased. Some folks use the clear clamshells or bags with a clear window, something like that to show what's in there. Um, generally speaking, a, a retail customer wants to see the product. Um, a wholesale customer is going to be able to determine the quality of the product from your initial sales and that ongoing consistency will be important, but it's not as important to display in terms of packaging. So you, that's kind of up to you how you want to go about it. Um, there's no specific rules, but it's going to depend on your market strategy. Labels, generally speaking, you're going to have the identity, um, the name of the farm. Most In most cases, you don't actually have to have your address, um, at least in New York State, as long as you're able to be found like through a Google search or something like that. It used to be, and, and still in some states, you have to have the full address and even a phone number. So do check with your local um, regulator about what kind of requirements for contact info needs to be on there. And you put your quantity of contents on the package. Uh, we could add to this list that traceability, the lot number or the batch number so that we can know if a customer uh, has an issue with your product that they can trace it back to when you harvested it um, and what might have caused those, those concerns in the first place. As far as pricing goes, what we see with uh, locally grown mushrooms is a premium price. So on the right there, we have our grocery store, kind of mass market, shiitake mushrooms. Um, <clears throat> doesn't matter if they're log grown or sawdust grown, but they're coming from those markets, which might be fetching um, 3 to $5 a pound, might be retailing for 6 to $8 a pound. What we see from growers over our experience through the small farm program is um, fetching prices in the range from 10 to 12 uh, for wholesale accounts and 12 to 16 or even more for retail. Uh, there's markets in New York City I work with that get $20 a pound. And so what's important to know about pricing is that there's no fixed prices. It's easier to lower prices than to raise prices. And so you start working within the confines of your market and you uh, reduce your prices as needed, uh, usually when you get into larger scales or larger quantities of sale. So here's a graph from a project we did several years ago showing on the gray bars, the average prices that uh, growers were getting per pound for mushrooms in different venues. The bar, the black bar there shows the range of prices. So you know, keep in mind that while the average for farmer's markets was around $15 a pound, 
some growers could get as much as 20 and some were getting you know uh, 10 or 11 dollars a pound so um, quite a range there but really good um, numbers in terms of profitability especially when you compare it to the larger terminal markets and things like that where we see um, you know the international trade and things like that showing up and what's key to think about prices is that the way you frame prices can really have a big impact on um, on your sales and so if you go to farmers market <clears throat> It's not really great to put $16 a pound on the sign that can scare away a lot of folks. Uh, research on farmers markets has shown that um, consumers like to pay between three and $5 per purchase and they like to buy you know, three to five things at market. So they wanna spend in that range. And so it's much more effective usually to market your mushrooms as you know, in the pint form, in the quart form and say, well, it's you know, $4 for this pint. And that usually equals about a quarter pound of mushrooms. So you're getting your $16 pound price it's not a deceptive thing, it's just the reality, and, but it looks on the surface as a much more reasonable price for those mushrooms as folks see them. For wholesale accounts, we might offer something like $12 a pound, but say we'll go down to 11 or, or 10 or 10.50 um, if you're gonna commit to us for this season. Um, our farm worked several years ago with a small butcher shop. And instead of deciding how many pound units we were gonna sell, what we worked with them to do was figure out what a $5 package looked like because they had figured through their market research that consumers would buy a lot more um, at the $5 range. And so we took into account their markup for selling the mushrooms, uh, our costs that we needed to meet, and we fit a package. Uh, we figured out a volume or a weight of those mushrooms that would meet that goal. And those mushrooms sold a lot better than when we just kind of winged it. For CSAs, sometimes you give them that seasonal price, but then you break it down into a weekly price so that uh, consumers are like, oh, I can, you know, $8 a week, that sounds pretty reasonable. Um, and you're gonna get these mushrooms for a, a period of time and that's a pretty good, pretty good way to market that. Cool. So that's uh, my basic piece here. I'm gonna um, stop sharing so Willie can take over and we're gonna just kind of cover a couple other elements in the puzzle here from our experience growing and selling and working with other growers. So Willie, I will let that. And if there's questions around those, those pieces, I um, encourage you to put them in the chat and I'll keep answering them as Willie talks. And I'll just remind you, we'll, we'll post that Harvest to Market guide on the Fungi Alley website. And you can also find it through www.cornellmushrooms.org. So thanks. Mm -hmm. And Greg, I'll just answer this question as we're transitioning here. He's asking more about that $5 story. Um, I'd have to look back at our notes, but I believe our weight <coughs> was around a third of a pound or a little more. Um, and we packaged them in that case in, they were biodegradable coffee bags that had that little window screen because they felt really strongly that it was important for the customers to see, but they didn't want to display them in a bulk fashion. And so, um, and so that was uh, a little more expensive packaging, but, um, but again, ended up in a, a greater increase in our sales. So it was worth it. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, this is, it's really nice. It's like settling to me to just like hear this information and I'm hoping for other people to just like, um, yeah, some more understanding of how this whole thing works and, and uh, to not be overwhelmed, you know, with like, what, yeah, how do I sell a mushroom? Like, is that allowed? This to be a farm. Um, so, wish I had that six, seven years ago, and um, glad, glad you're sharing all that stuff now. Um, so, I want to start out going into um backing up a little bit into the grow room and talking about both strains and uh strains and um initiation strategies for the different species um so yeah i'm going to go through and do that and then we'll uh, talk some about where maybe we're 
important um, opportunity there. So yeah, feel free to you know keep asking questions and being involved, and uh, we'll just we'll just work through this. Um, so starting out with shiitakes, um, the strains that I recommend um, for for sawdust is either 3782 or 3790. So those two are really gonna be the highest performing for sawdust. And for logs, uh, 46, either LE46 or WR46, so the same strain, um, are, are gonna be the highest yielding. Um, what's interesting is that 3790 um, tends to take a longer time, uh, a longer time to incubate um, but the mushrooms are larger. Uh, so you get kind of a higher quality mushroom that you can harvest faster. Um, and yields, you know, can, as long as that incubation time is longer, yields uh, can be similar. So I know growers who have gotten um, out 3790 is kind of lower because they're not letting it incubate long enough. But, uh, but once you allow, you know, if you let 3790 incubate for 10 weeks, 11 weeks, then yields will be pretty similar between the two different strains. Um, one of the biggest things about uh, cultivating shiitakes indoors on sawdust is that they take seven or eight weeks. They, they, they go through the first phase, which is, um, colonization of the blocks, which everything does, you know, it's just the mycelium growing out into the substrate. And then they go through this phase called popcorning, where the um, surface of the block gets all textured and has hills and valleys. And then finally, they go through a stage called browning. Um, and this whole process takes, uh, you know, pretty reliably seven weeks, eight weeks, a uh, little bit depending on the temperature. And they're, they're more sensitive to temperature swings and physical shock. So if in week six, all of a sudden in the incubation room, the temperatures drop down to 50 degrees, a lot of the shiitakes will start fruiting. Um, and same thing if you go through and kind of whack all the shiitake blocks in week six, they'll start fruiting prematurely. So um, you want to have, if you're going to be growing shiitakes, you want to have a, a good incubation setup and also a lot of space. And this is one of the reasons why some growers will, you know, focus on making blocks of oysters and lion's mane and piopino and buying shiitake blocks in, um, uh, or making, uh, you know, oysters on straw and then buying shiitake blocks in. Um, because shiitakes are such a space hog. Um, and harvest, usually after initiation. So to initiate shiitakes, it's a cold shock, and then the bags are completely removed. So you can see in this photo down here, there's no bag at all, right? So you completely remove the bag after a, you know, a 12 hour, 24 hour cold shock, and then place it into the grow room. Um, harvest typically takes about 10 days. Um, it's, it's very consistent and they won't fruit for a second time on their own. So you need to soak them, submerge them. So first you'd let them rest. So after harvest, you let them rest for about two to three weeks. And then they need to be soaked for five, six hours in order to um, uh, promote a second flush. Um, so that's, that's really unique to shiitakes, both the removing the bag and the requirement for soaking to produce a second flush. Um, and like I've talked about plenty, um, fruiting, both first flush and second flush can be done outside with, uh, with shiitakes. Um, Sean's asking if you hit the bags like pounding on logs to stimulate growth or fruiting. Um, I haven't found this to be necessary or necessarily helpful, but if, if the bags are in incubation, right, if they're just, if they've just popcorn and haven't browned, then, uh, and you hit them, move them around, then they'll start fruiting prematurely. So, um, yeah, no need to rough them up, uh, in order to get them to, to fruit well. Um, 
And Eric, I would remove the bags. So when you're removing the bags is after they have popcorn and browned. So probably it's, you know, two, three weeks for full colonization and then another two weeks for uh, uh, um, popcorning and then another two or three weeks to be fully browned. Um, and then that's when you would uh, put them in the walk-in cooler. And then as they come out of the walk-in cooler, remove the bags, right? Um, and ideally incubation is, you know, anywhere from 60 up to 75 uh, uh, degrees. Okay, um, so this is what this, this process in the grow room would look like. Over here, we have somewhere around day five. And in the grow room, in the first four days, like up to this stage, day five with the sawdust blocks, you can just blast them with a hose. The shiitakes really like, uh, especially when they first come out of the bag, just have all the days washed off with a hose and can just be sprayed down to really really um, increase the humidity level until they have pins that are, you know, like this, this size, like a fingernail size. After that, you don't want to get water directly on the mushrooms because it's going to um, uh, create disease. Um, so that's day five. Then two days later, you can see there's a pretty clear um, uh, distinction between the cap and the stem. Um, and then day 10, most of the mushrooms are ready to harvest. You still have a couple up here that are just pinning, you know, so sometimes there's a little bit of lag. Usually there's kind of like a three, four day window of harvesting where day one is kind of light day or yeah, the first day of harvesting is kind of light. And then the second and third days are heavy and the last day is kind of light again. Um, so, uh, and here you, you see, you know, what Steve was talking about on this last photo from the underside of this, this bottom one being really perfect uh, to, to harvest, um, and these ones too. So basically, once you can see the gills, uh, especially in the summertime, um, you want to go ahead and harvest shiitakes. Okay, so that's, that's kind of taking care of shiitakes and initiation and fruiting room. Um, now we're going to move on to oysters. Uh, which could be blue oysters or yellow oysters or pink oysters or phoenix oysters or black oysters. Any of those uh, would be treated the same. Um, my two favorite strains for uh, 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 blues is 123 or 3015. Um, those are both really high quality strains, fast growing, high yielding. Um, the 3014 is a strain from Amicel that is more like a Phoenix oyster. So, <clears throat> or sometimes it's called a brown oyster. So it's, it fruits much better in the summertime. So that's a good um, strain to go to during the summer or something, something like a Phoenix is another name you might see for it. Um, there's a new strain of, uh, uh, called black oyster. Uh, there's some other names, but, but black oyster is what I've seen most, most commonly, which is kind of a hybrid between a blue oyster and a king oyster. Um, so the stems are longer and it's a meatier mushroom and uh, it has better storability and, and better yields than uh, the typical king oysters, um, but has kind of their, their texture. Um, so that's a new strain. It's just in the last six months, I've seen people growing it in the U.S., um, so it's, it's pretty, pretty recent. Um, and these are growing much faster than the shiitakes, or they're ready to fruit much faster than the shiitakes. So incubation can be as low as 10 days, um, anywhere up to four weeks or so, uh, depending on the temperature that you're, you're uh, incubating at. Ideally, you know, 73 degrees. If you can have it to a degree, that's where I would keep it. Um, but it's, it's a range, you know, a range is fine. And What's really nice in the incubation stage is that CO2 isn't as much of an issue uh, as in fruiting. So you can just kind of keep the temperature at, you know, in the 70s and you don't have to be constantly exhausting, bringing fresh air into the room. Um, harvest again for oysters is about 10 days. And unlike shiitakes, uh, they'll just fruit from the same spot. Um, so you don't really you don't have to soak them. You don't really have to move them or do anything. They'll just, you know, two weeks later, 
through again from the same, uh, same place in the back. Um, to initiate oysters, uh, what I like to do is, is cut an X in the bag. So usually the bags are laid uh, you know, horizontally, uh, so laid down like that, and then an X in the bag um, uh, to expose air, um, to expose the block to air. Right? And, and usually I'll leave the um, plastic over where it's pinning so that it creates this like really high humidity for all the pins to start forming. And this is day you know, five or six right here um, where the, the mushrooms are, are pinning. There's a really clear pin set and they'll just push away the plastic X. So as they grow out, they'll just push that plastic away and um, um, you don't need to kind of manage the bags. Um, and, and oysters, once you see them, typically uh, get to full, full uh, body, full growth pretty quickly. Um, you know, in the summertime, if, if the grow room isn't well cooled, um, we would have to harvest oysters twice a day, you know, once in the morning, once at night, because they just grow so fast. Um, here you have day eight, two days later from here, and then two days later, you've got this big, beautiful bouquet um, of, of um, oysters. Um, when you're cutting the X into the bag, um, really you're just cutting the bag, um, but it's not a big deal if you cut into the substrate. So it's not like you need to cut deep into the substrate or it's really bad if you do cut into the substrate. Um, really, it's just about cutting in the, in the bag. Um, and you can also do a T, you know, that's another thing. It doesn't have to be a full X. You can just do a, a T, which I think is kind of what's happening in this first photo. Um, okay, oysters, there we go. Um, and, and other than shiitakes, like oysters and lion's mane, I don't tend to spray with, a, with some sort of hose or get water directly on them. It's really best with those to just keep the environment humid and moist and um, uh, not get water directly on the mushrooms. Okay, beautiful lion's mane. Um, two best strains that I've worked with are uh, Leighton Banks strain and the Lambert strain. Um, the Leighton Banks strain, it's, I mean, it's, it's amazing how uh, prolifically it fruits. It'll actually become so heavy that it just falls off of the block. Like it, it can't hold itself on anymore and it just plops off, um, which can be a good thing and a bad thing. Um, it's also not as tight. It's kind of more spread out um, um, than other strains that I've worked with. Uh, but in terms of yield, it has fantastic yield. Um, Lambert also has a fantastic strain um, of lion's mane. That's a really tight cluster, produces well and makes nice kind of uh, pom poms. Um, uh, this like a pom pom form um, out of the, the bag. Um, tends to take again anywhere from ten days to four weeks in incubation, and the the mycelium is much lighter and weaker than oyster mycelium. So even if you get like sh spawn shipped in or something, uh, it can break apart really easily. Um, and, and can kind of look like nothing's there. Um, but there's stuff there, and uh, the mycelium is just a little bit more, more faint. Um, the harvest cycle for lion's mane is a little bit longer than both shiitake and oyster. Usually it's about 14 days. Um, and there's, there's a little bit more wiggle room of when you can harvest. Um, so you can harvest, harvest the mushrooms a little bit earlier and not lose very much, uh, very much weight. Um, like oysters, the lion's mane will just continue to fruit um, out of the same uh, holes that are poked in the bag. Um, but it's really important, actually, with, with both of them, um, especially lion's mane, to remove any dead material. So make sure that you remove any dead uh, um, fruiting bodies or whatever is left over. Because if you don't, as the new mushrooms come out, it'll kind of like um, it'll incorporate the dead material into it and that will become a spot for disease. Um, so keeping those bags really clean is, is uh, very important. If you're leaving them in for 
multiple flushes. Um, the biggest downside with lion's mane is that it's really easy to bruise. So um, you want to make sure that handling is minimized and ideally that the lion's mane goes out as quick as possible um, uh, to, to the customer. Um, I didn't, I didn't have a good like beginning of lion's mane, but this, this picture on the left here is probably like uh, day eight, day nine. And you can see the spines when the first, when it first comes out, um, the mushroom's kind of pink and really tight. You can't even really see spines. And then by day eight or nine, um, it's more of this white colored and the spines are sticking directly out, right? So it kind of looks more like a spike ball or something. Um, like it might be spiky when you touch it. And then, uh, you know, five, six days later, that's when the lion's mane is more in this beard-like uh, formation where the spines are cascading down towards the uh, uh, floor and starting to have, you know, maybe a quarter of an inch, a third of an inch uh, length. Um, and this is anywhere in between these two is a good, good place to harvest. Um, so you won't lose a ton of weight if you harvest earlier with the spines kind of sticking out in this one. Um, but you're going to get the full formation and kind of classic lion's mane look at, at this, this stage. Um, but shelf life, you know, as you leave the mushroom more and more, and more to grow, um, shelf life goes down. Um, a couple of things that can go wrong in the grow room. Um, one is the, the biggest one um, is blotch. Um, so this is this really happens primarily on oysters and is kind of a uh, sunken orange uh, like holes that tend to be kind of wet um, and it really comes from excess water on the mushrooms. Um, so if you see this on your oyster mushrooms, um, you know it can it can cause total crop loss. Like maybe you can't sell it. Um, what you want to look for is, is the, are the orange spots dry or are they kind of like wet and spreading and, and rotting? If they're dry, it, the mushrooms are okay to sell. They might be a lower quality, um, but it's not like they're going to continue to have disease and, and really rot from uh, the blotch. But if they're wet and slippery, that means that bacteria is active and you definitely do not want to be selling um, those, those mushrooms. Um, to, to uh, cure blotch, if you're starting to get that in your grow room, what you want to do is try and decrease temperature, decrease humidity, make sure there isn't water getting directly on the mushrooms, and increase airflow. So basically, we're just trying to lower the temperature and lower the humidity, um, getting, getting rid of, of, of water, you know, and hoping that this doesn't negatively impact um, uh, pinning or fruiting. Um, but it's a bacteria, so uh, it really likes high heat and lots of kind of standing water. Um, so minimizing those effects is the uh, best approach. Um, this one's a doozy, uh, Norospora, um, is really, ha really hard to get rid of. It's an uh, orange-like mold, it's airborne. Um, it definitely shows up at a lot of different farms and you can, it, it's not like game over, your whole farm's done, but um, it becomes a nuisance. And this mainly uh, comes around when you're inoculating your own bags. Um, so if you're buying your buying bags in or if you're doing straw, um, I haven't seen a huge problem with Neurospora on straw, but as you get into some of the supplemented uh, sawdust mixtures, um, this one can, can be a real, uh, issue. Um, it gets in in little tiny holes into a uh, new substrate, um, holes in the filter patch or just a little pen hole in the, in the bag and then um, makes this kind of like cushiony orange uh, uh, growth. Um, so this hopefully won't be a problem for you um, and maybe if you see it uh, during when, when you get to the point of making your own substrate um, you're just going to have to increase. It's getting in during the inoculation process. So maybe you need to increase sterilization time. Maybe you need to replace a filter. 
Um, maybe you just need better personal hygiene in the lab. Um, so that's, that'll be, that's a big question if it comes up. Okay, probably the most common mold we run into as mushroom growers is trichoderma. Um, if you do straw, uh, I mean, uh, pretty much all the processes, logs, shiitakes on logs, um, oysters on straw, any supplemented sawdust formula, uh, trichoderma shows up. Um, if you're seeing it on your logs, it tends to just be because they're excessively wet. Um, the bark is staying excessively wet. So if you can do anything to kind of dry that bark off, um, that'll, that'll hit the trichoderma back. Um, or just, you know, if it's been rainy for a week and, um, and yeah, it's been rainy for a week and your logs start to so show trichoderma, probably in the next year or two when it's sunny, that'll just go away. Some natural ebb and flow. Um, if it's in, if it's in a substrate, uh, particularly with oysters, sometimes they can outgrow it. So if you see trichoderma, I wouldn't just throw away the bags right away. You kind of give it some time to see if the blog, if the um, mycelium can compete with the trichoderma. Um, and if it does grow over, awesome. Um, you can go ahead and fruit those bags. And even if it doesn't, say there's, you know, 20% of the bag is trichoderma, you can still fruit the bag, say it's um, from, from the space that's not filled with trichoderma. Right, so um, it'd be okay to fruit that bag still if it has a little bit. Um, you just don't want to be, you know, fruiting right where that that uh, trichoderma spot is. Um, and the green that you see is actually the spores of this mushroom. So when you see green like this, those are the spores being produced, and the mycelium is a light white color. So you can't tell from the mycelium if it's Mm, uh, like an oyster mushroom or a trichoderma, but the, the green is a really telltale sign. Um, and that pops up quickly. Uh, they sporulate really, really quickly. And never, ever, ever use a bag of spawn uh, with trichoderma to continue to expand uh, to new substrates. Um, because it's the spores, that green is spores, then it's not just going to be in that one tiny spot. You know, it's going to be distributed throughout the back. So um, if you ever receive spawn with trichoderma on it, definitely ask for a replacement. Take a, take a photo, send it to your spawn provider and ask for a replacement. And um, yeah, make sure you don't expand that uh, trichoderma out. Um, yeah, and you, can, you could, you know, uh, say if you're doing this with shiitakes and you had it out of the bag, um, you could just you know, cut off the trichoderma or um, spray it with some hydrogen peroxide or something, um, and that would totally be fine. Uh, with oysters or lion's mane, it's probably not worth it to like, go in and try and excavate that stuff. Um, I would just try and cut your X or your hole um, where the mushroom is fruiting out of away from the trichoderma, and, and that, should be, that should be fine. Um, yeah. Okay. So those are, those are some of the, the pathogens that you might see, uh, while you're, you're fruiting and, and growing, uh, mushrooms. Um, the other really common things with oysters, uh, is to have long stems. So when we're growing blue oysters or yellow oysters or pink oysters, the, the quality um, like tissue is in the cap. So what you want is big caps and little stems. Um, and as you can see with these uh, photos, we have the opposite of that. So this is a really low quality mushroom that most people wouldn't be excited about receiving. Um, so what's going on when you have uh, long stems? Well, two primary places to look is CO2 and lighting. So if the lighting is too low or too short, uh, you'll get these long stems, like the mushrooms are reaching for sunlight, um, just like plants do, right? So it's a uh, photo period, photo, uh, photosensitive or something, um, phototropic. Um, so you, so the, the mushrooms will respond to lighting. Um, 
you know, if you have that 16 hours on, eight hours off, uh, comfortable amount of light to read a book or something, then you'll, you'll totally be fine. Uh, the other piece with oysters is, is high CO2. So, um, so if your CO2 is getting above 800 parts per million, that's when you'll see these, these elongated stems. Um, and oysters are the most sensitive to it, so they're a pretty good indicator species. Uh, shiitakes and lion's mane will continue to kind of form naturally and, and, and properly uh, until CO2 two levels get up to, you know, 11. Uh, it's like, okay, I need to fix this the next crop. Um, so once you see, see really long stems at this stage, um, then you know that your CO2 levels are, are excessively high and um, need to kind of adjust that for the, for the next crop that's coming along. Or even for the next flush, you know, you could just harvest these mushrooms right off and be like, okay, I don't want the block to put any more energy into these, this cluster and, um, you know, hopefully it just starts fruiting again in, in two weeks or so. Um, and with really high CO2, there won't be any fruiting at all, you know. So if you get up into the 1500 parts per million, that's when you just get no fruiting. Um, and in some species like king oyster and anoki, um, this can actually be desirable. You know, anoki, um, they, they grow in the northeast and they're a brown mushroom with a regular cap and stem, but they get that long, white, thin, uh, look to them like noodles or something um, from being grown in low light, high CO2 environments and from strain selection. So in some, in some cases that can be desirable. All right, so where, where is the uh, industry? Where is everything? Uh, where are some of the other opportunities um, with mushroom cultivation? Um, this is a article from Wednesday, a week ago, um, from CNN and a bunch of different news, news places picked this up. Um, just of like mushrooms are the, the new celebrity. They're like the new, they're taking over the produce aisle. Um, and in both the, uh, the quantity, the quantity of mushrooms being sold, the average price has increased. Um, you know, a big, a big part of what is tracked is um, uh, button mushrooms and um, not specialty mushrooms. So the average price right now, I think, is like four dollars, four, four dollars and fifteen cents or something per pound. Um, but that's not really accounting for special. of uh, total mushroom sales um, and yeah and this the, the amount of specialty mushrooms being sold is increasing as well so you're getting an increase in total sales an increase in price and an increase in diversity of the types of uh, mushrooms that are being sold um, so I think it's exciting to see this in mainstream news and obviously um, Obviously, that's gonna, you know, this trend is going to continue. I know last year, mushrooms, Whole Foods was saying that mushrooms was like one of the top five trending foods. Um, so it's not like this is just like, oh, this year it's hitting news. Over the last three, four years, this, this, this increase has really been happening. Um, and in terms of production from 2015 to 2017, um, there's an increase of 1.1 million pounds produced each year. So each year, um, the amount of mushrooms has increased, and this year is no different. You know, still, their mushroom farms are finding, okay, we need to produce more. And what's interesting is that this production is being kind of uh, conglomerated more and more into less farms. So interesting, interestingly, this over the same time period, uh, there were less farms. Um, so, uh, yeah, it makes me wonder why. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is to that. But obviously there's opportunities. Um, and I think that the, the uh, I think it's something like 60 or 70% uh, 
of these mushrooms are produced in the Kennett Square area. Um, and as local, local markets increase and people continue to be excited about local food, um, plugging in as small farmers with mushrooms uh, is, is definitely an, an opportunity. Um, and what's really interesting over the last year, um, you, we've seen a big shift in the large farms from producing their own blocks of shiitakes uh, to actually importing blocks from China. And some of the large block suppliers like um, KSS Sales and uh, Oakshire have been really struggling with um, kind of keeping up with, with those blocks coming in. And it's weird because you can ship blocks in from China, fruit them in the US and call it US grown, right? Which is um, a really like a, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of shocked by that. Um, I don't know if it's deception or like inaccuracy or just like lack of education um, with uh, that's really special to mushroom cultivation. So that's something that's been kind of unfolding over the last year or two. Um, and if you, the, the blocks that come in from China are more circular. They're like, uh, like a tube or something. Uh, and the blocks that are typically produced in the U.S. are uh, squares you know they're more like blocks instead of um long tube like they're they in china they make more like a synthetic log so they make the shape similar to what a log would would be um and the blocks fruit really well um they're high quality and the cost is probably two dollars less than um blocks you can get that are made in the u.s so um you know, I, th I think th this is another thing that's interesting and, and over time as consumers become more educated because, you know, people that are getting excited about mushrooms and getting excited about local and U.S. grown don't want, don't want products coming in from China and being fruited and sold like they're from the U.S. So as consumer education picks up, I think it'll continue to be a benefit for uh, small scale growers entering the market and local growers entering the market and just be like, hey, we know where all of our substrate is coming from. We know our suppliers um, and, and this, is, this is something that isn't being you know, shipped across the ocean in shipping containers. Um, a huge area that's increasing is medicinal mushrooms. I'm sure everyone has in some way interacted uh, with medicinal mushrooms. Um, in one way or the other, whether you've seen them in the grocery store or you're taking them now or just seen articles about them. Um, this industry is expected to go up to $34 billion worldwide by 2024. So it's expected to, I think it's right now, it's at something like 20 billion, something like that. Eight, maybe last year is 18 or 19 billion. And the projections are that it's going to just totally keep on increasing. Um, so again, there's, there's this opportunity, I think, for local uh, mushroom producers to not only tap into the culinary markets and the, the food markets, but start to, start to think about how can I create a product that would tap into this market, tap into the medicinal mushroom market. And um, there's, there's similar to with the, the blocks coming in from China, there's this level of um, education that is happening um, with with producers that or with consumers um, that I think will slowly shift where people are spending their money in this in the medicinal mushroom market. Um, so this is the back of a, um, a typical uh, formula you might see in grocery store, um, and what you'll notice here is that. For each of the uh, ingredients listed, uh, you have mycelium, right? So you have chaga mycelium, maitake mycelium, rishi mycelium, cordyceps mycelium. And there's only one here, uh, right here, maitake, uh, which is fruiting bodies. So these actually aren't, a lot of these products actually aren't mushrooms. They're mycelium. It's a different stage of the fungal life cycle. So when you break that down, the total of what's in a serving is about a thousand milligrams. 
and only 16 milligrams are from an actual mushroom or from a fruiting body. So that's uh, like 1%, 1.5% are from uh, mushroom fruiting bodies and the other 98.5% is actually from the, the mushroom mycelium. And so it's a, it's a different, um, different life cycle, different life stage. And there's a lot of questions of, is, are they the same? Is the efficacy of uh, mushroom fruiting bodies the same as uh, uh, mycelium? Um, and when you look at these two products, so here's what they, uh, the, the mycelium on grain uh, would look like. Uh, it might be more colonized than this, but the thing with growing mycelium is that you can't separate it from the substrate. So you end up with both mycelium and grain in the product um, compared with your mushroom where you know you're getting all fungal tissue, right? If you're using mushrooms in a product, in a, um, yeah, in any product, then you know it's 100% fungal tissue. If you're using uh, the grain, the mycelium on grain, well, how much of the grain is not digested yet? How much is still in this in just grain and how much is mycelium? Uh, so that's a question that's been playing out uh, um, in the in the industry. And Austin in one of his patents uh, says that anywhere from 50 to 70 in like the average uh, product, anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of the grain might not be converted into mycelium. So that would mean that, you know, of that 98% that is supposed to be fungal tissue, almost 65, 70% is just rice, right? So um, that's a huge question that I think the medicinal mushroom industry is going to have to face and uh, consumers as they become, um, you know, more active in that, are going to start shifting where they're spending their money. And again, a, a really big opportunity for uh, local small farms um, producing mushrooms, you know, being able to educate people about what's going on, what's in their products and developing trust of, hey, you know, you can, you know what is going into uh, this medicine or this uh, supplement um, that you're using. Um, so a couple of interesting uh, articles here and, and uh, on, in the scientific literature, the big thing that's being debated is uh, beta-glucan content. And typically beta-glucans are what are measured to um, uh, say if a mushroom is going to have health benefits. Um, and one of the things that Paul Stamets is saying is that, well, it's not just beta-glucans, there's also these uh, Arabinixalines, um, which uh, can can have uh, um, health benefits, um, but there's a lot of other products other than medicinal mushrooms where those compounds show up. Um, beta glucans seem to be pretty unique to uh, mushroom fruiting bodies. Um, this is if you're interested in in learning more about this. You can look at, N Namex put out a really good uh, kind of version of this, um, talking about what beta-glucans are, what they measure. And they did a study um, uh, measuring uh, mushroom-based uh, products and mycelium-based products. And they looked at the amount of beta-glucans and uh, starch in those products, suggesting that the beta-glucans are the fungal tissue and the starch is basically the, the rice. Um, and what they found is these top three are the mushroom-based products, which have the blue is beta-glucans, so you have really high beta-glucans, and the green is starch, so you have almost no starch. Um, whereas all the mycelium products, you can see there's um, some beta-glucans, but primarily starch. So um, yeah, there's, it's just begging a lot of questions. And, and what's difficult right now to, um, to decipher is, is 
that it's only people that have financial interest um, that are doing these studies. So Namex sells um, products that are mushroom based um, um, and mycelium based products are their competitors. So um, it would be really, really helpful to see some third party studies. I know Bastyr did one and they found a very similar thing of mycelium based products um, did not produce the uh, uh, same effects as uh, mushroom based products. And at the same time, a lot of this is happening at the like cellular testing level. So very little, if any, um, human studies have been done in the United States. There have been a fair amount of human studies done in Japan and China, and there are some um, uh, uh, certified drugs derived from mushrooms that are being used there. Um, but on uh, here in the U.S., we're kind of slow on, on coming up with that. Um, but in the supplement market, medicinal mushrooms are really, really, really uh, expanding. Um, and likely everyone has been uh, tuned in and hearing about some, some progress and changes with uh, psil psilocybin, uh, magic mushrooms. Um, at, there's been a lot of research at John Hopkins um, uh, talking about the benefits of using psilocybin uh, for depression or PTSD. Um, and recently, Oakland and Denver, and uh, I know that uh, there's another Santa Monica or no, Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz uh, in California is considering, considering um, taking psilocybin, like decriminalizing psilocybin essentially. So uh, this is something that it's interesting and is, is nice to kind of keep your eye on in the medicinal or in the mushroom field because um, more and more people are uh, just learning more about psilocybin and asking questions uh, uh, with it and know that this is a schedule one drug. So. Um, I was reading something in John Hopkins of them um, kind of moving towards proposing it be rescheduled as a schedule four, which is similar to like sleeping aids. Um, but currently it's a schedule one. So um, definitely don't, don't like dive into psilocybe cultiva cultivation. That's a bad idea. Um, but another piece of, of awareness in the general public and uh, with people of what are mushrooms, what are the benefits that they have. And, um, you know, if you sell mushrooms at a farmer's market, you always get someone coming up and being like, oh, you got any good mushrooms or something? And I always like to, to like keep a little paper bag behind with some dried out shiitakes and be like, yeah, 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 50 bucks, 50 bucks and hand them the bag. And, you know, it's just dried shiitakes. Um, so it, it's fun to play with that. And it can also get kind of annoying because there's a lot of, benefits that mushroom have um, beyond just psilocybe. Um, but hopefully at some point our culture is ready to uh, be responsible with this, uh, uh, with this mushroom and, and use it. Um, and a fun little diagram of function. And then on the right, uh, your brain um, on psilocybe mushrooms. So, um, yeah, it's, it's overwhelming what is happening there, um, but obviously things that can be rewired and reconnected and um, seen and experienced in a whole new way, which I'm guessing is, is why there might be some benefits uh, with, you know, untreatable depression or addiction or um, PTSD, um, changing the way that we potentially relate to our experiences and who we are and um, the stories that we believe. So um, that's, that's, that's our series. Um, that's our three week series. And we're going to be, um, we're going to be posting uh, the application um, tomorrow. It'll, it'll be up by, you know, maybe noon or something tomorrow. Um, so definitely check out the application, apply uh, if you want to continue to be part of this project. Uh, again, what we're looking for is 
um, about 10 growers that are interested in growing um, 900 pounds of mushrooms uh, between now and, um, and December. Um, and um, are willing to collect data and willing to keep working with Steve and I and talking to us. And um, um, yeah, and in exchange, you know, you get some consultations and just um, visits at the farm, one or two visits at the farm, um, and $500 for either blocks or uh, spawn. Um, so, the app, the application is going to be available tomorrow and then will be due on March 3rd. So we have like a week or two to fill out the application and then we'll get back to people by about, um, we'll aim for March 15th, I'm pretty sure we said, um, if not sooner, because we know it's, it's um, uh, important to get that, get that out. Um, and to be for this project, um, we are looking at one of the three methods of cultivation. So either making your own blocks, buying blocks in, or um, you doing oysters on straw. So we're not we're not looking to work with um, uh, law grown shiitake law, law growers um, for for this project. Um, there's our, there was already a Sarah project done with law growers. So um, that's that's. Uh, kind of what, what's going on there. Um, the website uh, that has that has the application is fungi ally um, fungi ally dot com uh, slash growing dash mushrooms, and I just put that into the um, webinar chat, so you can just click right on it if you would like to. Um, And yeah, the mushrooms, any, any species is fine. Um, shiitake, oysters, lion's mane, piopino, chestnut. Um, yeah, you, any, any of them are, are great. Um, uh, type of straw impact oyster performance? Not that I know of. Um, uh, not that I know of, Mike. Um, yeah, Kara, I'll show that slide about the six things that identify you as a farm. Sure thing. Um, this one? Is this it? Hope so. Um, all right. Let's see. Let me know if I miss anything, but we'll just answer some questions and hang out and people are, people are welcome to come and go as they please. And uh, as I said, uh, thank you. Thank you for attending these three weeks. And I hope that you um, learned some things about mushrooms and just got excited about mushrooms and have the, the opportunity to um, uh, had the opportunity to just develop more of a relationship with mushrooms. So tomorrow, talk to some people about mushrooms. Just tell them something you learned. And um, yeah, hope, hope your, your relationship continues to evolve. Um, and see you later. Yeah, feel free to work, reach out with questions and um, uh, you can contact me at willie at fungially.com, willie with a IE. Um, and Steve and I are doing a class through Cornell that starts next Tuesday. If you want to sign up, um, the link is towards the top of the webinar chat box. Um, and um, anything else I want to tell you? Uh, yeah, if you, I mean, yeah. My company, Fungi Ally, sells spawn and grow kits. So if you ever like, like, oh, I want some, want to try this out, um, check us out. And, um, and if you want to get someone a cool Christmas present or something. Um, and also, if you live in Massachusetts or live close, I have a bunch of uh, fans and a couple of sealers and, um, and a couple of filter, like, uh, um, uh, HEPA filters that I'm trying to get rid of. So feel free to email me um, 
about picking those up. Um, and I'll put my email in the chat box. Okay, um, go work through some questions and um, yeah, hang around as long as you want. Uh, so who would you say was doing the grant for law growing? Um, so, so Sarah did a, did a grant back in 2007 or something about gathering data for log cultivation. So uh, you can find information about log cultivation um, either on the um, small farms page or uh, on the SARE page. Um, there's, that's not an active grant. Um, I am not currently selling uh, uh, bulk amounts of ready to fruit blocks. Um, I'd recommend uh, reaching out to um, uh, Mike Oterra or Cap and Stem or uh, just mushroom farmers near you or KSS Sales or Field and Forest. I think they do like eight, eight or ten. Um, I think it's eight um, uh, quanti quantities. So if you just want some uh, to try out or something, that might be a good avenue. Um, um how do you dispose of the water with lime after soaking um just i dump it out on a wine cap and make sure you have a ph buffer but just don't dump it into like an open water source um but if you just dump it you know on a grass or something then it it's it's fine um it just acclimates and goes through root systems and is, is okay um it, what is it? Uh, neutralizes. Um, if growing multiple species, do we list them all at once in the crop decision tool, or do we have to fill it out separately for each species? Um, you can list them all together, Sharon. Um, so you don't have to list each species. Just say that, you know, plan on growing 20 pounds of shiitakes, five pounds of lion's mane, 15 pounds of oysters or something. And it's it's really reasonable for those to shift. Um, so we're just looking for an average of total mushrooms. We don't have to know exactly, um, you don't have to do it for each species. It is good to know what your projection overall is. So you can just let us know, yeah, this is the breakdown of what we plan for weekly. And um, yeah, that'll, that'll be good. Uh, fruiting chamber equipment, humidity control sensors, AC, etc. Um, you can check out our course for that, and I think just Facebook forums and stuff. Uh, House of Hydro is great for humidity. Um, Apollo fans are really good for moving air. Um, yeah, AC, Home Depot. Um, Okay, if I have a room with fresh air being blown in, can I cycle the mixed air in the room with another inline HEPA filter or purifier rather than having to exhaust my spores? Um, so the biggest thing, you, you're not gonna, in the grow room, you're not gonna need a HEPA filter. Um, and the biggest thing is really you're moving CO2 out. Um, um, yeah, you're moving CO2 out. So. Uh, it's not, you're not really going to want to mix air um, in the grow room. Uh, Q-pair device, awesome. Sounds good. Um, you might want to start a little bit lower than that, um, but yeah, whatever. That's cool. Um, yeah, as long as you got some capital that you're ready to throw down, then you can totally do it. Um, Okay, do you need to cold shock shiitake rated fruit blocks? Yeah, I'd recommend cold shocking. I mean, basically when you get the blocks in, I just put them right into a walk-in cooler, you know, and then boom, there's your cold shock. Um, so yes. Um, Anthony's asking difference between um, fungi ally online course and Cornell small farms uh, online course. Um, yeah, we both got online courses going. Um, what's the difference? They're pretty similar. Um, yeah, they're, they're pretty similar. Um, 